Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to another session of On The Couch. I'm saying good morning if you're in the UK, but good afternoon, good evening if you're anywhere else in the world. On The Couch is the podcast for creative professionals everywhere. We're part of the Creatives Group, a private networking group for creative professionals of all industries to come together, connect, support, develop and grow their creative businesses. I'm Melanie Perry. And I'm Julie hyde And this is On The Couch. Julie, who is on the couch with us today? And we have Ptolemy Elrington. Hello, Ptolemy. Hello. Nice to have you join us all the way from Brighton here in the UK. Well, Ptolemy is a sculptor and has been a professional sculptor for the past 20 years. He's very much an eco-artist, to coin a phrase. Uh, using recycled items and materials in his artworks, which mostly feature wild animals and creatures. And his work has been shown and exhibited in London and the South East here in the UK, and also in exhibitions in Ireland, Greece, Spain, and Russia. And his business profile on LinkedIn is Hub Cat Creatures. So, Ptolemy, let's kick off by asking you, out of all the junk out there, why Hubcaps. Well, it's not just hubcaps that I'm working with at the moment. I also uh, use old shopping trolleys, car parts, plastic and things like that. But I have to confess that my one true sculpture love is hubcaps. Um, they're very pretty to me, shiny, silver, available. And uh, they, uh, ingredients wise, they have a great deal of potential. Uh, I find them easy to work with, although I've been doing it for many years. Um, I know a few people that have tried to work with them and have found it a little bit more difficult than they imagined. Um, but um, it's kind of like a little niche thing for me as well, because there are a few other people that I've inspired to have a go at uh, doing what I do. But as far as I'm aware, I'm the only uh, full-time hubcap artist. Yeah, because I've never seen it before. Before I saw your beautiful creations on LinkedIn, and I'm so glad I did, because anybody, please go follow Ptolemy, because his sculptures are just amazing. Um, but how, how difficult is it for to do hubcaps? And also, because of the, the progression of modern cars, are hubcaps getting more difficult to find w w with the advent of alloy wheels and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. That's a question that's been put to me before uh, in terms of uh, running out of materials. Um, yeah, there are a lot more alloy wheels around than when I first started, but that means that there's also a lot more hubcaps because people don't want them anymore. So um, actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a strange subculture of hubcap collectors who, uh, who, who, who obsess about all the different types. And occasionally I, uh, I get very occasionally I get negative comments from them about the fact that I've used a particularly rare one in a way that they don't think is appropriate, um, <laughs> which amuses me. <laughs> but um, there, is, there are loads and loads and loads. Of, they're not, I'm not going to run out of them in my lifetime. In my studio, I've got maybe 2,000 or so. Um, I used to trade them sometimes with collectors if I have a rare one they're happy to give me a bag of 10 you know for my one rare one so I can build up my stock like that because I'm not fussy I mean uh, I know what I want to use it doesn't have to be a rare one um, um and uh yeah yeah I've, basically I've got them coming out my ears <laughs> so your studio is just like a rubbish dump <laughs> it's, 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 In a a bit more, way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit more orderly than a rubbish dump and uh, uh and does and smells a lot nicer um but um yeah i do have a, an enormous amount of junk oh bless it. well if there's any people out there who are coveting that rare hubcap you never know who's out there get in touch with ptolemy because he might actually have it and he might trade you for some other ones for his for you his sculptures know. so how is how is Using, I mean, you touched on it earlier about um, it's quite difficult to use hubcaps in sculpture. Tell us a little bit more about that. Why is it more difficult um, than some people might think? Well, um, because uh, the car hubcaps or wheel trims, as we call them in the UK, are um, made by so many different com companies uh, internationally. And also there's, there's a great aftermarket um, sort of hubcap 
thing going on. You can buy all sorts of unusual designs. And so basically what I'm trying to tell you is that they're made out of loads and loads of different sorts of plastics. So some of them extremely flexible, easy to cut, uh, easy to work with. Some of them are very brittle. Some of them um, uh, almost impossible to work with. Obviously, because I've been doing it for this length of time, I'm, I'm familiar with in a general sense with um, most of them about about the composite materials and how they behave in the ways that I want them to. Um, but there's a lot of physical hard work. Okay, first off, especially because I, I deal with recycled stuff, it's usually filthy. So and, it, and it's not a nice uh, dirt either. It's not like earth or anything healthy. It, it's really kind of unpleasant. So you know, you need full protective gear, and you need to kind of clean them really thoroughly, even just before beginning, then you've got to just kind of source the shapes that you want out of uh, the various hubcaps that you're using. Uh, and then you've got to cut them up and obviously different materials behave in different ways. You can use knife, you can use um, a reciprocating saw or hacks, various hacksaws, and they all require certain amount of knowledge beforehand so that you know what you're doing so you're not wasting your time and making life more difficult for yourself it's fascinating there's a lot of information there it is it's fascinating <laughs> it's like something that you know I, I love meeting people like you because it wouldn't occur to me to make something out of a hubcap <laughs> <laughs> would it you julie is it hubcaps uh, how can I, hubcaps I become beautiful art <laughs> Well, I can I can run you through my initial inspiration if you like. Yeah, please. I used to I used to live up in uh, Bradford in Yorkshire, and I live fairly near a sharp bend in the road. There's some potholes on this bend, and it's quite a fast road. and And I noticed after a while that what happens well when if you if you're barreling on, along in your car and you've got hubcaps and you go over a pothole while you're going around the corner, if the if the hubcap isn't necessarily attached very brilliantly or if it's a if it's a poor quality attachment or if it's started to come off you know maybe you had your your your, your tire change and it wasn't put on properly or something um you go over this pothole and bam it pings off and rolls off and and, and and ends up on the grass and i noticed a few of these on the grass and they caught the sun they were shiny some interesting designs and then a council dust cart went by and picked them up and I assume they went into landfill or they were, you know, um, put into one of those big furnace things. And I thought that was a real waste. I thought about, you know, somebody out there has designed that thing. It's been manufactured, you know, and although essentially they're decorative things, they're not particularly useful. You know, they still like had a kind of a value. So I started collecting with a sort of idea that I wanted to do something with them, but I didn't know what. And I had, ended up having a big stack in my house wondering what to do with them because, I, I, you know, I'm not a collector by nature. So I wasn't trying to begin a hubcap collection. I just wanted to use them for something. And so... Um, I suddenly got struck on the idea of like um, making a suit of armor. I thought it'd be really cool to make a full size kind of human being out of these things. And so I started looking at them in more detail and fiddling with them and cutting them up and bending them and trying to do things with them. And then I saw kind of a fish shape within one of the ones that I was cutting up. And so I kind of made a fish and then I made another fish and then I made another fish and then I made a shark and it just carried on like that. And I still haven't got around to making the suit of armor, but that's how I began. Wow. And because most of your sculptures that we see are, are kind of wildlife and animals that, that I've seen on um, LinkedIn anyway. So is that your main passion, wildlife sculpture? Yeah, um, I was brought up in the country. My mum was a massive bird watcher. I was in the RSPB. Well, it was the it was called the YSPB, I think, when I was a, a little one. So, you know, and we always had dogs and chickens and all sorts on the farm, cats and things. So I've always had animals around me and I've always loved animals. So um and as, as I said, I started with fish and then and then purely because of the shape. Of, of, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, part of the hubcap that I saw. Um, and so I just kind of like developed, carried on and on from there. I've had a few commissions of other things, some of them, you know, fairly random. Like I made a train for somebody. I've made a few full size, you know, human sculptures. You know, I've done a variety of other things, but nature and wildlife and particularly birds and fish always draw me back. Mm. Well, you have some very impressive corporate clients, and obviously you take um, private commissions as well. How do you balance what you do or what you feel as an artist 
to uh, or with uh, what your clients want? That's a good question. Um, there's there's a couple of uh, elements to doing corporate work that I'm suited for, and one element that I'm not suited for. Um, my work is can be quite scruffy um, because I like uh, it to look like the stuff that it's made from, as well as the thing that it's meant to be, and that can put some people off who like things to be really crisp and clean. Um, that's one thing um working with corporate clients um there's uh, a hierarchy that you have to interact with when you work with corporates and the higher ups in the hierarchy the decision makers the button pressers the people who are in charge of the budget and releasing information and things uh, often don't necessarily have a realistic uh, perspective on the needs and the desires of the artist and so you have to try to bridge that gap and that's useful if you have a good contact within a corporate um, structure because then they can act as your interpreter if you like but um, trying to get the idea across to somebody um, about a technical aspect of the work um, it can be quite difficult and requires patience and time mm -hmm. Uh, and luckily, I because I've been working with corporates for a while on and off, then then I've kind of developed those skills. And um, I'm a lit. I'm not like one of those fussy people that rushes off and has a hissy fit if they don't get exactly what they want when they want it, which is something I have encountered every now and again in the art world. Um, so generally speaking, um, I develop a good relationship with a corporate mm -hmm. client. Um, I've worked with some, and, and the thing is, I have my own perspective and viewpoint on corporations, but also working within the corporate world, um, I've met some really great people, some really sincere and positive people, which is good for me because it reminds me that um, life is complex. Yeah, yeah. I imagine it's quite hard, and 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 I think that happens with all all creatives dealing with corporates. You know, you have to. Make sure you're connecting with the right people who kind of get get the whole concept because artists you know art, art is art you know and and some people just don't get it they kind of want what they want and and that's it and you're thinking but there, there's a process there is a process and there is a creative yeah. kind of passion yeah. that goes on without it and you have to feel it as well as just deliver it i think well what I is think I... the process i mean if, if a corporate client comes to you and says right i want a life-size horse for example rearing up uh, how do you start making that well, um, sorry, I'm just going to jump back because I feel like I didn't fully answer your last question properly, which is about oh, a reconciliation. I'm sorry, I too early. Sorry. Oh no, no, not at all. It's me. I was I started talking, and then when I get going, sometimes I forget the initial point. But you asked about how I reconcile my um, my artistic kind of sensibilities along with a corporate client. Um, basically, you've got to pay the rent, you know, and uh, uh, and I, I could kind of like completely focus on my own work but if i utterly focused on my own work and i didn't take corporate commissions then i would have to develop another skill which is basically promote self-promotion and i am so rubbish at that i do i i post stuff up, up online and i take photos of my work but when it comes to like uh, talking at length and selling myself i find that really difficult even just finding the right avenues to explore to be able to do that I find really difficult I've got a child uh, and uh, that takes up a lot of my time and a lot of my energy and uh, you know I, I find it really difficult as I say to, to, to do those kinds of things so um, um, corporate jobs as they come along um, provided they have a, an eco um, side to them um, then I'm always happy to discuss Mm. yeah i think that's right you know at least those parts of your values are aligned you know you you are you know you use recyclable things you've got a very healthy interest in the environment and if the corporate is has got that and there's sort of a corporate sustainability side then and i think i mean companies are tending to more and more that way aren't they at, at the moment that they're taking a lot more of interest of the environment and um and things like that than perhaps a few years ago well um uh, cynically speaking, some companies like to tick the uh, greenwash box. You know, they have um, uh, a budget which they they're, they're assigned as part of 
I don't know, whatever project they're doing or something um, that needs to um, put forward that eco face to the public. Um, but that's that, that I've been I've been kind of obviously not explicitly aware of that, but I have been very suspicious of that on a, on, on a couple of occasions. But generally speaking, as I said before, I, I working with some of the people that work with corporates who, who have a genuine interest and a genuine drive in that area. But usually what it is, is it's to promote an eco product that the company has has, has recently produced and they want to get uh, airplay. They want they, they want to create something that is noticeable and that will get picked up by the media and therefore will promote their product, which is fair enough. And if it's an eco product, I can't really complain about mm. that. What's been your favourite piece to sculpt so far? <laughs> I can't answer that question. <laughs> I've got I've got quite a few favourite pieces. They're often, you know, when I've done them um, and I finished them and I'm really happy with them, it's they're often commissions, um, which uh, it's just real, you know, it's terrible because then I, you know, once they're finished, they have to go. I can't hang on to them. But as I said before, you know, we've all got bills to pay, so they, they do have to move. Um, most of the pieces that I make, I would like to keep. But I can't they do. are lovely. I mean, the pictures that you put up, we're going we're gonna to show a few now. I'm just going to do a little slideshow of some of Ptolemy's work. But uh, I can imagine as an artist working on something I imagine it would be quite hard to let it go because your work is is really lovely. And if I had the budget, I'd be buying left, right and centre. I have to say there's been quite a few of your pieces that have popped up. Oh, I want that one. <laughs> well, you put so much of yourself in it, 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 into them all. So it must be like tearing your heart and soul out when you have to give them up. It's a little, a little like that. Um, yeah, um, uh, my focus and attention and uh, my inspiration, um, all of those things that go into the work um, are, are, are clearly a kind of like a part, a part of me. And um, some of the pieces develop such character when I'm making them that um, it does feel a little bit, uh, a little bit dishonourable to, 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 to like pass them on, <laughs> like you're My baby. You know, abandoning a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, leaving, leaving your baby. I did have. Um, uh, I had two. I've, I've, I've had two favourite pieces that I've kind of kept in my personal collection. It, there were three, but uh, uh, one of them got stolen from an exhibition and uh, has uh, never uh, swam back to me. Um, but who knows? Maybe one day. Oh, so who, who steals art? Shame on you, whoever you are. <laughs> how, how do you start me. off, though, um, Ptolemy? Uh, you know, if, if you. If somebody says, right, I want uh, you to do an octopus. How, how do you start off making something like that? What's your process? Uh, uh, yeah, you, you asked this question earlier, didn't you? And yes. Um, well, uh, I, okay, the, 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 it, 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 to a degree, it depends on, on the client. Um, somebody might say to me, I've seen your work, I love your work. Um, uh, can I have something a bit like this? Or would you make me one of these or one of those? So then I need to find out from them um, what size, that's obviously quite important because if they're gonna display it in their house or in their garden or something, you know, uh, or, they, or even if they have a preconception about kind of roughly what size it's going to be. So I need to kind of fit to that. Then obviously the material, um, and obviously the budget that's quite an important part of it and make sure that all those things are all kind of like cleared up and then um basically i just get stuck in it's kind of like uh sketching in 3d where i'll look at okay for instance i'm going to make uh, say a stickleback for somebody and they want it to be one meter long so i'll look at images of sticklebacks so i'll look at videos if it's something that i'm not very familiar with or i'm not confident with i'll try to see it in life because that really helps obviously and maybe sketch from life or take some videos and then work work from that and then i just find a part of it that looks like the part that i want to start and i'll find a piece that works and then try to shape that piece to get that to to, to represent the section that I want to do. And then if it's not quite right, I'll chop it and change it, add bits, take bits away, and then spread out from there. And then before I know what's happening, I've got a stickle back in the lap. Amazing. I just think it's amazing. So I, I know you went to art college. What 
What drew you to sculpture as opposed to um, you know, painting or drawing or any other type of art? What, what was it about sculpture that drew you? Good question. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I think I was 21, and um, when I, dropped, I left school when I was 16, I did a few different bits and pieces, and then I, I parted for about, I don't know, three or four years and kind of just had a good time trying to, I'd kind of, sort of kind of trying to find who I was and where I was going, but, you know, making up as I went along, you know, odd jobs and a lot of socialising and things like you do when you're that age. And, um, and then I was kind of thinking, I need to do something, but I don't know what. So I had a conversation with myself, what do I like and what am I good at? And the only thing I could really think of was, was creative stuff. So, because I, obviously I, I've, I've done jobs, but working for somebody and, you know, doing something that you don't particularly enjoy, to me, seems a waste of time. I mean, other people are happy and they have got mortgages and things. I'm not knocking it. But for me personally, that wasn't the direction I wanted to go in. Um, so I, th I thought art. So I tried to get on an art course. Um, but at the time I was unemployed and there were certain restrictions, which meant I couldn't go on a full time art course. I could only go on a part time art course. So I started doing this part time art course and they worked on that, got a huge body of work together because, you know, when I'm into something, I, I, I get stuck in, you know, and I didn't have a family or anything then. So I had lots more spare time. Um, and I just really got into it and I, I, I created enough work and was convincing enough to get onto a degree course, which was a multimedia course because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, pr previously it had all been like drawing uh, related stuff, 2D related stuff, pretty much a little bit 3D. So on the three year multimedia course, I did everything, printmaking, photography, um, working with textile, sculpture. And at the end of that, I definitely was leaning towards the sculpture and enjoying that part of the creative process. But unfortunately, the whole art thing, the, the, the whole art college thing, it put me off art for a while. <laughs> I did like a lot of um, community art, working on festivals and giant parties, doing, you know, making enormous kind of interactive sculptural things and some painting work, you know, on, on all sorts of different things for a while. Um, but my personal uh sense of satisfaction and drive kept taking me back to making sculptural items you know as gifts for people as you know just a hobby if you like and then uh slowly you know especially with the hubcaps and the novelty factor connected to those that kind of um slowly kind of just led me in this direction so that's how a professional sculptor or a sculptor become a professional sculptor you start off giving out gifts and then you start charging slowly is that how you make a living out of it well yeah that, i mean that's how kind of um how it develops uh, i guess for some people that's how, certainly how it how it developed for me but i kind of would classify myself as a professional sculptor tour when i started uh, you know I, I formed a limited company and decided to commit all of my working time to being sculptor, which was in 2002, I think. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of when I decided that, that I, I and, and to, to be honest, I don't consider myself a sculptor and I don't consider myself an artist. It's, it's useful for me to use these words to describe myself so that people can understand. But I just think of myself as somebody that just makes stuff and enjoys it. <laughs> so you're a stuff maker. Yeah, professional make professional stuff. sculptor sounds a lot nicer than somebody that makes stuff. Okay, so as a sculptor, an artist, a sculptor, obviously you have to have, or you need the talent to begin with, but what would you recommend to budding artists uh, who want to become sculptors um, or budding sculptors? Uh, what would you recommend, um, what? What would they? What should they do to make to make um, a living out of something that they love doing? Um, give us your top three tips. Well, commitment is the main one. Um, genuine commitment. I mean, even if it, you just continue to do it as a hobby, um, you, you really do have to keep at it for a long time. You have to keep working and. If you personally feel, <clears throat> if you personally feel that 
you get a lot out of it, even if you don't necessarily get much kind of financial reward or, you know, approbation from other other people. You just got to keep at it. You got to keep at it because it's it gives you an internal personal reward that you can't put a value on that. I think that's enormously important. Um, um, the second uh, uh, thing I recommend, well, I, I urge you to do if you're a, a, you know, a creative person that's like heading in this direction is, is about looking. It's a, it's a, a teaching, a visual teaching thing. But basically I discovered when I was uh, learning uh, how to draw properly um, that, that, that there's a massive percentage of observation involved. You know, if you watch an artist that's drawing from life, um, most of the time they're not looking at the paper and the pencil, they're looking at what they're drawing. And that's something that I've learned that you you really truly do have to focus on. It's very easy to make mistakes. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's quite difficult to step back from those mistakes. So it's always good to do your homework to keep your focus up to keep looking while, while you're working otherwise um, it can all go wrong um, and the third one is uh, um, I mentioned briefly before that um, art college put me off art um, and I've matured a bit since then um, the, the, the thing about it that, that put me off was about marketing about pushing yourself and uh, at the time when I was at college I was kind of like but an artist you know it has to create art and that's all that they do they don't um, uh, you know talk to people they don't talk to customers they don't push themselves because that's not part of art well actually yeah I was wrong um, and I've realized that since then that if you want to get yourself out there then you don't necessarily have to sell yourself but you have to be prepared to kind of like talk to people and to do work that you might not want to do in relation to your work in, in order to get it out there in the world mm. so yeah you and you've got to work hard at that yeah yeah and it, it is especially um for people like us who are small businesses and and you know sole traders you know when you're the person who is creating the product i mean julie and i are the same with our, our video creation and media creation you know you kind of have to be a jack of all trades you know you are providing your your expertise in your service but you do also have to be somewhat of a marketing expert and you have to be your own accountant and you have to kind of keep the threads until you can afford to pay other people to do those things for you you kind of have to be on it but the good news i guess these days is that with social media it's easier to put yourself out there to especially visually for, for artists it's great because instagram linkedin facebook you know you've got the platforms that are free that you can put photography of your art out there it's it, it's not like you have to go and knock on doors or make those horrible cold phone calls anymore is it yeah i'll go to personally go to galleries or something yeah yeah it was the um it was the web that launched me actually um uh, because I'd, I'd, I'd started producing work, I'd sold um, a few pieces uh, through cafes. This is while I was still um, a hobby artist. Um, um, I sold a couple of pieces through cafes in Brighton. And I have a, I had a friend, I've kind of lost contact with him now, but he um, was into building websites and he liked my work. So he offered to build me a basic website in exchange for some work. So I was like, yeah, OK, let's do it. And then one of those kind of online novelty sites that um, showcases other people's websites um, found me. And uh, and then yeah, that created a great deal of online interest, which was the springboard that got me to think, well, maybe using this as a as a, a way of selling my work, then perhaps maybe I can go professional and uh, and. Uh, spend my life doing what I want to do yeah yeah fantastic absolutely fantastic so well, so I found you on LinkedIn you know um and great and please do follow Ptolemy Ptolemy Ellerington on LinkedIn the details are going across the bottom um and check out his website hubca hubcapcreatures.com um to see his creations obviously we've been showing some throughout this show but it's amazing he does the most amazing things and when I'm rich and famous I'm gonna buy some too <laughs> <laughs> you get mates right Rates, okay. Oh, mate, you heard it here, mates rates. He said it now. Um, <laughs> but he are you very pricey then, Ptolemy? Are you very pricey? You can only millionaires buy your stuff now. Well, um, and obviously, you know, price, uh, price is kind of like um, very subjective, uh, uh, depending on where you are in the world and your expectations. Um, we are used to kind of uh, mass manufacture. So um, compared to that, you know, yeah, my stuff mm -hmm. is expensive. Um, I charge time because a lot of the time my materials um, don't cost anything. So it's it's purely 
time I charge for. Yeah, and, and skill, um, and skill. Because, well, you know, yeah, skill and, and, and experience. Creation. To be honest, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty cheap, you know, and, and, and people who understand and know about what I'm doing and how long it takes me to make work say that I undercharge. But I've had a few people that have argued against that. <laughs> Do you have payment plans? <laughs> <laughs> I have done that occasionally, yeah, yeah. But it's all, you know, it's small business, you know, you speak to me direct. So, yeah. you know, you can always work something out. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Right, we've got the last few minutes left. So we are going to play our lovely Values Jam game. I'm going to give my, my cards a bit of a shuffle. And then I'm, what I'm going to do is I'll hold my, my deck up, Ptolemy, and I'll run my finger along the card. You say stop, and we will pick a card, and then we'll talk about that particular value. And it'll be very interesting to see um, right. what comes up, because um, these cards have been quite spooky. With A lot of our guests, the cards that, that our guests have been picking have been so pertinent to what we've been talking about and what their own values are. It has been quite freaky, hasn't it, Julie? It has, um, yeah. It'll be very interesting to see what, what comes yeah. out of today. So, right, I'll try and do this. There you go, you can see. So if I, oh, there, there we go. So if I run stop. along, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> right, we have got, ooh, we've got, let's see, love. Oh, that's a big subject. Card. We've got the love card. So, Right. When have you experienced love, would you say, Ptolemy? Are we talking personal or work? Um, either, whichever context you'd like to, to I'll say work, because we're talking about work, really. So let's keep it to do with the art, I would say. OK. Uh, since um, a youngster, I've kind of, and, and, and as, you know, as life has passed me by, I've kind of um, experienced, I've, I've come to realise that there are many different kinds of love. You know, uh, but each one is, you know, obviously valid and uh, and can be quite strong. Um, and it's easy to confuse love with a number of other emotions and another. Uh, but then it's not of its on its own. It's kind of like connected and integrated with other things. So which makes it incredibly and it's also very subjective as well. So it's very complicated to kind of pin it down. But. To be honest, work-wise, I don't know if I would use the word love to describe how I feel about my work, but I definitely do love doing what I do. Uh, but it's almost kind of like, you could say I love breathing, but you don't <laughs> love breathing. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a part of you and you have yeah. to do it. But if someone said to you, right, you can't sculpt anymore, I'm gonna take that away from you and you've gotta go and be an accountant or something how would it make you feel <laughs> well one time <laughs> one time i uh, i went uh, traveling for a year i went abroad for a year and i took a couple of sketchbooks with me um because i knew that i wouldn't this was already when i was doing 3d work and i knew that that was kind of the direction that i was definitely heading in um so i knew that i wouldn't be able to do any 3d work because of the nature of the uh, life that i was choosing to live for a brief period of time uh, and within two weeks of leaving the uk um i was poems were coming out of me uh, and I'd, I'd never written poetry before loads of poems are coming out of me and i was sitting and sketching and sitting and sketching so i think if i was going to be an accountant i probably would get into trouble because i'd probably like be sketching or something on the desk when i should be like i don't know doing data input or something like that yeah or maybe you'd be a bit creative with those accounts we've all heard the term creative accounting <laughs> maybe, creative maybe accounting, you'd be really creative yeah. <laughs> there's some there's some legal gray areas around that i think <laughs> or, or, or you'd probably land up um, making animals out of your staplers and your pens <laughs> <laughs> or well, sneakily collecting all the polystyrene cups from the drinks dispenser and yeah. making something out of them yeah. i don't think you'd make a very good accountant Oliver. i don't think i would <laughs> 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 have you done those year end of financials no but he's a, he's a little polystyrene man i made from the cups in a gas exactly yeah <laughs> oh, it's been lovely talking to you Ptolemy. it really is 
and hopefully you'll keep in touch. And um, as Melanie said, anybody who wants to see this wonderful stuff that uh, Ptolemy creates, uh, just go onto his website uh, underneath there and obviously um, follow him on LinkedIn. Yeah. It's do. been a real pleasure talking to you. Brilliant. And we'd love to have you have you come back one day as, as well and, and tell us some more. But that's all we've got time for today. This has been On the Couch with Melanie and Julie and the wonderful Tommy Errington from HubCreatures.com. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.